Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you, Ray, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this and to join you for biosimilar breakfast and to set my alarm for 5 a.m., so I appreciate it. Um, so this is a, a very, I think, hot topic right now in terms of how the payers are dealing with it, how the FDA are dealing with it, and how people are incorporating it into their practice. So what I'm going to do is really cover some of the background to this and give you some uh, rationale for how it's come about, and then uh, Dr. Dubinsky is going to deal with more practical using it in your practice. So how did we get here, or what's the rationale between, about having biosimilars uh, available in IBD? These are my disclosures. Um, so I'm going to cover these six topics here, looking about you know, what defines a biosimilar versus an originator product. Um, what are the ones that are available right now well, they're in the pipeline, what are approved, and then what are commercially available, because they're not all the same. How they get manufactured at a very global level as a concept. Um, what the pathway is within the FDA to approve them. And this concept, which you'll, was referred to in some of the questions, the FDA uses this concept of totality of evidence accumulating a lot of evidence from different sources to approve biosimilars. Um, and then this difference between being interchangeable and extrapolating data from other indications to our I IBD indications. So there's a kind of overview of what we're going to touch on uh, in this, this session. Um, so the first question I, I, I guess most people want to know is what? What is a biosimilar? Is it a generic? Is it a newer version of an old drug? And so I think the best way to think about this is how we think of our existing small molecules, so say like azathioprine, how they're manufactured versus how a bio, biologic is manufactured, and that is the key to why we have biosimilars and not generics of antibodies. So on the bottom you can see if you want to make azathioprine, you get a bunch of chemicals, mix them at the right temperature and pressure, and you can produce the exact same azathioprine every time, every batch, every manufacturing uh, process. In total contrast, if you want to make a biologic like infliximab, you basically have to put a genetic sequence into a cell line, and then you're really, for most of these in this manner, then asking nature to create that monoclonal antibody in these bioreactors. And you can control the genetic sequence, you can control what cell line you're using, but once nature starts to make those, there are all slight variations that nature includes in manufacturing these large antibodies. And so from that point of view, it's a far more complex system. And as a consequence, what comes out the far end is never going to be an exact identical to the original antibody you're trying to produce. There are always slight uh, modifications that nature introduces in the, in the production process. So that's at a global overview as to how these are different. And so the an analogy I like to use is that biologics are like beers. If you're a craft brewer, and you want, are given the same ingredients, water, hops, yeast, whatever, to make beer to five or six different craft breweries, they'll all be slightly different, but essentially using the same ingredients, and it's pretty much the same beer, but it's not identical from each craft brewery. Lemonade, on the other hand, is totally different. You just got lemon, sugar, water. Everyone will make that probably identical. But beers, because of the brewing process, because nature's involved in that process itself, the fermentation process, how that occurs, it means that a biologic is always going to be a bit more like a beer than a small molecule reproduction is a bit more like lemonade. So I hope that analogy helps. Um, and part of the reason is that antibodies are just so big. Here's a two-scale uh, comparison of azathioprine to infliximab, right? You can see now why it's so complex to make an identical version of infliximab versus making an identical version of azathioprine. And uh, uh, probably a better analogy than this, even if uh, azathioprine was the size of a bicycle, infliximab is the size of a Learjet. And so if you want to replicate any of these uh, compounds, they're just so large and complex, they're never going to be an exact replica of what you're producing. But the key question is, does the antibody that you've produced as a biosimilar of the originator have the same effect, both in the lab and in patients? So the FDA, to kind of get more granular, will define a biosimilar as any uh, agent that is highly similar to the reference product, but it's not identical. But critically, there can be no clinically meaningful differences in terms of either safety, purity, or potency to the originator. So if you want to make a biosimilar of infliximab, it has to meet those criteria. Highly similar, looks similar in the lab, 
look similar in the clinic in terms of outcomes. And so that's why when you compare then making a biosimilar, let's say, of Remicade or Infliximab, you essentially just take a sequence, you put it in a cell line. Usually there are very similar cell lines are used in many of these processes. You use a bioreactor, then you produce a biosimilar version of Infliximab. Now, how these are named now, you can see the bottom. The top is the original Infliximab um, version. The bottom then gets these four uh, letter sequence at the end to identify this as a biosimilar version of infliximab. These letters mean nothing, it's just like a random code, but each biosimilar version of infliximab will have this four letter sequence which is different for each biosimilar, so you know this is biosimilar X, biosimilar Y, biosimilar Z of infliximab. So that's your way of knowing um, when you see these products that they are a biosimilar of infliximab with a unique identifying code at the end to know which biosimilar of the original it is. Um, and so where are these differences? So people often say, well, okay, you're highly similar, but they're not identical. So why are they not identical? And there are small structural changes that occur during the manufacturing process by these cell lines that differentiate them. The most common one that we see that's talked about are these, the glycosylation chains. These are short or long chains of sugars off the antibody. And they can be highly variable between different, between the biosimilar version of infliximab and the originator infliximab. But even between batches of drugs, these can be different. And this figure here shows you that if you look at the FC portion here, I think I have the pointer. The FC portion here, you've got these uh, sugar chains, and they can differ between products. And in theory, these sugar chains um, may impact PK or PD. In reality, it appears that the changes are very minimal, if any, between um, compounds based on these. But for the FDA's point of view, they want to know exactly how these sugar chains influence these factors. So that's a critical part of the FDA process uh, when comparing a biosimilar to an originator product. Um, and here's an example. So this is a study uh, not too long ago looking at three different things. On the far left, you can see it's the um, differences in the sugars between three um, biosimilars. Then you have the differences in a cell assay between the three. And the very end, then you have the, the changes or the differences in um, TNF binding. So what you can see on one is there are some differences in sugars between the three um, agents. In two, there are some differences in how they affect cell-mediated toxicity. But most importantly, in three, for all three, even though there were slight differences in sugars, slight, slight differences in a cell assay, the binding to TNF, which what we think is how the drug works, was identical across the board. So that just reflects subtle cellular changes, but not an impact on the overall effect of the drug, which is binding to TNF. Now, one other question that always comes up is, well, if this is highly similar to uh, Remicade, let's say, would an antibody to Remicade bind to one of these biosimilars? And, and the answer from this uh, nice study from an Israeli group is that, yes, that if you have antibodies to Remicade, those antibodies will also recognize a biosimilar version of Remicade. And this is looking at these uh, spike samples, looking at ATI samples, and the ability of patients who have antibodies to infliximab to recognize a biosimilar version of infliximab. So that's key. If you've got a patient who's demonstrated to have ATIs to Remicade, putting them on a biosimilar version is totally pointless because the same antibodies will recognize the biosimilar. So circling back to the my beer analogy, these are highly similar products but they're not identical. And even between Remicade 1997 is highly similar but not identical to Remicade 2007, which is different to Remicade 2017. And so the drug we're using now for Remicade for our patients is not identical to the drug we were using 10 years ago or 20 years ago, or even the drug that was used in the trials that got it approved. So that's worth thinking in terms of you know, what differences we're seeing. So you may have Four versions of infliximab, one for infliximab 97, Remicade, Remicade 2007, and then two biosimilars from more recent years, all highly similar but not identical, but essentially doing the same thing at the TNF level and at the clinical and safety level. And that's the goal. Um, and to give you an example, Remicade has had over 30 manufacturing changes since it was originally produced, and each of these, in theory, could produce a biosimilar version of the original Remicade from 1997. 
So that's worth keeping that in mind when we think about um, how different these are. Many of the drugs we're using are actually different to the versions that were approved originally or that we were using 10 years ago. So what's the landscape right now? So there are many FDA-approved biosimilars, but very few commercially used. And so there's a difference there. Uh, as you can see here, there are three uh, biosimilar versions of infliximab. There are now five biosimilar versions of adalimumab approved, but not commercially available. Um, most of them have been approved already, but I think the earliest in terms of availability is going to be 2023 or 25. But it's a, a, a little bit off because of um, IP issues and patent issues. But they're already FDA approved, you just haven't seen them yet in clinic. But once this patent dead, deadline uh, expires, you're going to see a number of versions of biosimilar adalimumab on the market and commercially available. So that's going to make give you a huge range of choice of biosimilars, so that's why it's important that we recognize you know, how to identify them based on their four-letter codes and what, how they differ from the originator products. So the pipeline is quite packed, not just for our drugs. There are multiple biosimilars of Ritanercept, Adalimumab, Rituximab. The industry as a whole is making lots of biosimilar versions, so I would say get used to this. This is going to be very uh, frequent. In Europe, in some countries, biosimilars now have replaced the originator product in almost 90% of cases. So the uptake in Europe has been huge. The example here I give is Denmark. Almost 90% of, uh, of, of infliximab in Denmark is now biosimilar infliximab. So they've really taken this on mainly because of cost savings. And so we're a little bit behind the curve here in uptake. Secondly, how do they get approved? Well, the pipeline's a bit different. You know, if you're going to get an originator monoclonal antibody approved, it's a long, slow process of um, clinical trials, functional tests, structural tests, but most of the effort is getting the clinical trials done. That's flipped for biosimilar. Most of the work is in, in showing how similar is the reference product, doing some functional assays in the lab to show it behaves similarly in the lab, and the very smallest part then is having a clinical trial that can um, be used to get an indication. And so for the clinical trial, they just must show equivalence in terms of efficacy and safety in a key clinical trial, and that can be in any indication. It could be in RA, it could be in UC, it could be in Crohn's disease. Um, so this concept of extrapolation is that you get, uh, you do a clinical trial in one indication, let's say RA, it proves to be similar efficacy as the originator, similar safety, and then you can extrapolate that to other indications. So for example, you might look at biosimilar infliximab, get a, a clinical trial in RA for the FDA, and then say, well, based on this, we can extrapolate the data, it worked the same, the safety is the same, now we will approve it for use in UC or Crohn's disease. So that's the idea of extrapolation. Um, and so you have to show similarity in terms of clinical efficacy, um, you have to be able to show the MOA is similar and the chemical properties are similar in terms of predictability. Another concept is interchangeability and this concept is that if you get approved for uh, let's say biosimilar X that you could interchange between a bunch of biosimilars of that product um, without having any input from the physician or prescriber so that you consider them directly interchangeable and use in any indication, any scenario. And so this is separate FDA scenario. None of the ones approved yet have been approved for interchangeable between any indication, any scenario. And so that's an important for your questions. There's no biosimilar yet. Any US state and disease state has been approved as interchangeable between uh, indications. Um, so the concept here is you would take, to do this, you'd have to do an interchangeable trial where you take a patient on the one drug switch them over to the biosimilar version and then switch them back. So you'd have single switch, double switch, or triple switch. You can see on the image there these switch studies where you're going back and forth between the originator and the biosimilar. To do that, you'd have to, to get interchangeable status, you must be able to do that in a clinical trial. And none of the FDA approved products yet have done this, these multiple switch um, studies to get approval. So I've already pointed that out. I think for, at a practical level, many states have already introduced some rules or regulations on interchangeability. But in the reality, many payers are also introducing rules on or criteria for switching or the, um, requiring you to switch in various scenarios. So that's important to think about. 
many states have legislations on this. You can see your own state there, either pending or in the, in already approved on how it can be interchanged. I won't um, dwell too much on what each state is doing other than to say Mass has its own rules. I'm sure your state has its own rules. How did that get in there? <laughs> Pittsburgh has its own rules <laughs> for everything, for football and everything else. So what might that look like at a practical level? You might, for example, prescribe infliximab. The payer may approve infliximab DYYB, but the pharmacy, the especially pharmacy, may dispense infliximab ADDA. So that's a potential scenario with an interchangeability uh, situation. So the CC, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, have a position statement on this. The details are there. Most professional groups have recommended a lot of testing and confirmation that these are as safe as the originator um, to do this because you want to be sure if you're switching a patient once, you can reassuringly tell this patient this is safe, this is going to work just as well as the last agent did. Finally, there are a couple of areas of uncertainty. Uh, the main thing is, is, is the immunogenicity, so the development of antibodies over a long term similar to the reference product. Um, how can you track that at the pharmacy level, what your patient's getting each time? What are the mucosal healing rates that has not been done in IBD yet? And the last thing I'll point you out is that there is a concept of drift, is that if the originator drifts in its structure or formulation over time, that then it will drift with each batch away from what the biosimilar of that is at the approval level. So that's a concept to think about, this concept of drift. And finally, when patients get switched, um, will there be a cost saving for our patients? That's TBD. We haven't seen that yet. Europe has seen big cost savings at the patient level. But we haven't seen it yet here in the United States. And I think I will leave it at that. Thank you.